I can remember years ago when I was like 18, 19 years old, 20 years old, I was in San, I was up in Los Angeles and I was working with a bunch of realtors and people. I was just a young kid and I met a kid. His name was Mike Glickman. And Mike was passionate about real estate. When Mike was a young kid, he decided he wanted to be a real estate agent. That was his passion in life. He just wanted to light people up, help them find the home they want. And he wanted to work in a high-end community in LA. There's a community there called Encino, California. It's kind of an upscale community. And Mike's this young kid, and he wasn't even old enough to drive a car, and he wanted to be in real estate. Well, of course, you can't be a real estate salesman. You can't sign contracts until you're over 18. So when he was 16 and 17, even before he had a car, he'd use his bike. And in those days, before the Internet, people used to make these booklets of homes for sale. They'd distribute them, you know, near coffee shops and things. And so a guy hired him to go take his bike and eventually his car and go deliver all these. So he at least felt like he was getting in the real estate game. Finally, he turns 18, gets in real estate, decides his farm, that's what they call it in real estate, the area he's going to network, the area he's going to work, you know, the geographical area, the number of streets, is in Encino, this high-end area, and he thinks he's going to set the world on fire because he's really a good guy and he's got a good heart and he's really committed and he loves real estate and he loves people. But his first year, he sells zero, zero. Why? He's broke. He's on commission. He can't sell anything because he's really young. He's 18 years old and he looks like he's 16. And he couldn't articulate why buy from me versus someone else. And so people, one, look at him. He can't articulate it. I need somebody with more experience. They may not always tell him that, but he wouldn't get the listings, didn't get the sales. And we're having this conversation saying, like, how do you turn this around? Because I was really young, too. Like, how do I get? And I realized the way I was going to build my brand was results. Robbins equals results. I'm going to go challenge psychiatrists and psychologists, and I'm going to take the patient they've been working with for seven years, and I'm going to handle it in one hour and get rid of their phobia. One hour to around. That's how I built my career in the beginning. So I said, you need to do something. Because people know by what you do, not by what you say. How your lips move don't mean squat. If you want to know what Tony Robbins is, you can see how my feet, my lips, and my wallet, and my being has moved for 44 years. It's not hard to figure out who I am. So I said in the beginning, though, you got to demonstrate who you are. And he goes, well, I don't have a lot of money to do advertising. I said, I don't think you should. I think you should figure out something to do for your community. That you're not just doing it for marketing. You're doing it because it matters. You're doing it because you sincerely care, because people will feel when it's real. You can all, we all have large bulk meters today, right? You can sense when somebody's just selling you, or they, maybe they're selling you something, but they're not trying to sell you. It's just they know it's true. This is really that good, and you can feel the difference. I said, so find something you can do consistently or something big you can do for your community and do the right thing, and your brand will grow. And to his credit, I don't know how many months it was, months later, we had another conversation. He goes, Tony, I think I may have figured this out. I said, what? What did you figure out? He goes, there's a trash strike right now. I'm sure you've seen on television. The trash union went on strike. And he goes, Tony, you know, I walk through and I drive through my farm, and it's filthy. If this trash strike went on, I think at this point it had been like six weeks. So, you know, one week and your trash doesn't get picked up, it builds up. Imagine six weeks with the trash, and dogs are getting into it. Now rats are going into community. It's a high-end community. People are pissed off when they come home. Like, why the hell won't they pick up the trash? This is insane. They've turned our community into a hole. It's horrible. And he goes, you know, I thought for myself, you know, I can't do it for everybody, but what if I just took my farm, my community that I network, and what if I hired like an outside private trash company, take all their trash away, and then told everybody I did it? I said, do it, but don't tell everybody you did it. He goes, what are you talking about? Then why would I do it? I said, do it because it's right. And eventually people will learn without you telling them. If you go and tell everybody you did it, they're going to feel like it's just a promotion. But if you really are feeling the way you're telling me, and I really respect that, then this would be an incredible service to the families that you're there for. He goes, yeah, I don't know how much it would cost. I said, go find out. And he came back, and I don't remember the number. It's been so many years, but I think it was like $4,000. But $4,000 for him was like, you know, 40000 or 400000 back then. And I said to him, buddy, you could spend $4,000 doing ads and no one will know who you are. Find your passion. You're going to have this tremendous energy. It's sustainable energy. But momentum requires you always do the next thing to keep the momentum going. And the reason you get yourself in a passionate place is so that you change your life. And the only thing that changes your life is making a decision. There are two ways to be successful. And I don't subscribe to the first one. That's just natural talent.
I just don't believe people who are naturally talented are better than me. I believe effort, and you've heard me say it, your mama might come from privilege. Your daddy might come from privilege. Your daddy might own a company. You might have a father that can give you everything your little heart desires, but you will not outwork me. Why? Because I realize that the bigger the dream, more effort you're going to have to put in. It is possible to start with nothing and become something so that you have become more yourself. How can I grow today? I don't want to be the same person 365 days from today. We're in hell right now. And we can stay here, get the shit kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back into the light. We can climb out of hell. One inch at a time. So all I want you to do when you look at your dream, you say to yourself every day, it's possible. You say that every day to yourself, it's possible. You start right here. And when do you start? You start right now. Because the idea isn't going to execute itself. And, and the book isn't going to write itself. And the, the weights out in the gym, they're not going to move themselves. You have to do it. And you have to do it now. You got to take ownership. I take full responsibility. And I'll do whatever it takes. I take ownership. I'll get up. I'll stay late. And that's why you point the finger. That's why you say he did it and she did it. Because you don't like how the pain feels. That's why you give the power away. Because it hurt too bad to say, I did it. I take ownership. It was my fault. You ain't ready for the pain. You never looked at yourself in the mirror and said, you let you down. It's not a matter of whether or not we can. Everybody can, but not everybody will. Always go to something bigger than yourself. Are you not guilty of immersing yourself into things that were too small to hold your vision? Are you trying to take a bath in a bowl? Completely that. Right. Yeah. And then he made me wait and he gave me so many challenges and tests along the way to see how serious I was as a student. And I did everything he told me to do. What did he tell you to do? What was oh, he thing? told me to find my way from Perth, Western Australia to Hawaii. And I was a student in college, I had no money. So when I got a job washing dishes in an airport, literally plain loads of dishes, you know, so after I'd finished engineering classes, I'd go to the airport and work for five, six hours, washing dishes, saving up money. He'd teach me how to concentrate, He'd teach me how to mind works. We communicate over email, give me homework to do, give me tasks that were really painful, like coloring. I'm like, why am I coloring? You know, I don't want to color pictures. And, but I just did everything. I trusted him. I trusted the process. I did the work and I fulfilled it. And I finished the work and I went back to him and I said, Guru Deva, it's done. What's next? And he wanted you to do these kind of seemingly mundane things. Yeah, and I never complained about them, right? It seemed mundane, but I trusted him. He was my teacher, and if he told me to scrub the floor, I'd scrub the floor. You know, and I'd scrub it really well, better than he could imagine I could scrub it. And then I'd go and say, it's done. And I might do a little bit more than I think I can. But nowadays people, like we were chatting earlier, you know, if someone wants to learn martial arts, they want to learn the quick swirl 360 kung fu kick in the air or something you know no one wants to go and do the hard work and that's all about the quick fix you know how can i get from a to b as quickly as possible it doesn't work that way yeah i mean these days people watch the ufc and they want to go to jiu-jitsu class and learn like the special gogo pata choke or yeah. the check hook in boxing but if you go yeah. to an old school boxing coach he'll literally make you do footwork for like a year right. or throw a jab in the air for a year and then or you go you know to china and they'll have you you know stick your hands in sand for a year right. they're waiting to see if if you're willing to put in the time and yeah. if you can maybe get to a quiet mental space as well right? yes and it's not only about training the body it's about training the mind too right the mind needs to adjust and the mind is like a muscle it needs to reshape itself to be able to take on a new way of thinking and a new way of behaving and you know, progressively hold that new shape. And that only comes through repetition and patience and slow, 
hard work of doing the same thing over and over again. You know, one of my good friends is an Olympic gold medalist. She won the gold medal in beach volleyball. And she told me, when, and she had an amazing teacher, a coach, she said, and she said at one time the coach made her work on the volleyball court, do footwork for six months with no ball. So they trained for six months on the sand with no ball, and it was beach volleyball. And, you know, she did whatever her coach told her to do. She said she grumbled, but she did it. But that's the training that most people just don't want to go through. You know, and, and, and I think so many teachers out there are selling quick fixes. And because they have never been trained themselves properly, so they just, they've got a quick fix learning to get from A to B, so then they go and teach a quick way to get from A to B. You know, they don't understand this whole traditional path of slowly learning and developing yourself over a period of time is, is what really creates mastery in a certain level. In the monastery, living a celibate life in a cloistered monastery, away from your family, friends, your relatives, you know, waking up early in the morning, strict discipline and training, eating three meals a day, it takes 36 years before you're qualified as a teacher. 36 years. So if I lived only 10 years, I'm not even anywhere close to that. And I'm still a student.